God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning, Ali. God bless you. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome. Thank the Lord for yet another day. We're excited because we're able to stand in for our bishop this week. So we thank God for this opportunity. Hallelujah. Welcome. Welcome, Evangelist Carter, God, uh, Clanton, brother. Amen. So good to see you this morning. Hallelujah. Good to see you. Praise God. Welcome, Glory and Rich Shaw. Praise the Lord for you, sir. Ma'am, praise God for you all. Hallelujah. We want to say good morning. We're excited again yet to be here this morning to be able to do the Lord's will and do the Lord's work. Hallelujah. Uh, I want to get our hearts ready this morning. We're in uh, this mindset this morning that we need to be able to pray. Good morning, Sister Yarbrough. Hallelujah. We need to get our minds ready this morning for what the Lord has prepared for us at the table. And I tell you, I'm excited about being able to do the work of the Lord and knowing that morning manna, even though our, our man of God is not here this week, enjoying himself here in Lady, Lady Bedden, but we thank God that we're able to step in, feel in. And so let's, let's welcome everyone to the table this morning. Let's welcome everyone to the table. Uh, I want your hearts to be ready to pray this morning. Let all of our hearts be ready. Turn our hearts to prayer. The Bible says we should always ought to be able to pray. Amen. Good morning, Sister Jackie. Amen. We should always be prepared. Our hearts should always be prepared to pray. Uh, I know that's right, Sister McGee. We have to be ready to pray. It's all about yes and amen at the table. Good morning, Sister Brockington. God bless you. Our hearts should never be at a point where, where we don't uh, be able to have the mind to pray. Our mind should always be on prayer. And we know that prayer is that which connects us to our heavenly father, our heavenly savior, our heavenly, our Holy Spirit. Good morning. How you doing? How you doing? Praise the Lord. Uh, but prayer is, should and always be an essential part of our lives. And what we need to add to prayer, Sister Rollins, is we have to add our fasting. The Bible says some things can only happen through prayer and fasting. So we know that fasting is also an essential element of our prayer life. At least it should be. I don't know how many of us uh, take the time to yet fast, but some things in life requires fasting and prayer. And it's time to pray. So let's begin to put into the chat, put into uh, the window here about the things that we want to bring before the Lord, things that we want to pray about. And then we'll begin to take those things to our Lord in prayer. But again, I, I cannot tell you how important uh, prayer is to my life. And I know it has to be to your lives if you're up this morning and you're saying, let's pray, let's pray, Bishop, let's pray. Good morning, Sister Cole. God bless you, ma'am. But we have to be able to have a disciplined prayer life. If our prayer life is not disciplined, then we're going through what we call the motions, and that's not where we need to be. See, if you're going through the motions, that means you're tied to emotions, and emotions don't move God. It is your heart that moves God. And so we thank the Lord. Good morning, Sister Tinsley. God bless you, ma'am. We thank God for Dr. C. Wright. Praise God. God bless you, Sister Willis. Amen. But our hearts need to be always. God bless you, Brother Dave. We have to be ready to have our minds focused on God. So if you know somebody this morning that you want to let us pray about, 
Let us bring that to the table this morning. Let us bring that to this table this morning because it truly is about prayer. It's about how disciplined our lives are and how we need to make sure that what we're asking God to do that he's going to do. The scripture says this, and I want you to catch this. The scripture says, what two or more who would gather themselves in his name, he said he'd be there in the midst of them. Call somebody. He said he'd be there in the midst of them. Here's something else that the Lord said. He said, he said if you... If two or more of you touch and agree on any one thing, our God said he'd do it. So this is why, this is why if you don't understand the, 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 the power of prayer, and I've always told people this, if you cannot believe in the one you pray to, then why pray? Because if the, the one you're praying to is the one who answers prayer. I don't answer prayer. You don't answer prayer. What we're doing is asking God in prayer. So this is why I wanted to take the time this morning on behalf uh, of our bishop, Bishop Benton, God bless him, he and Lady Benton. Praise God for each and every one of you, amen, that we're here at this table this morning, that we're carrying on and doing what we're supposed to do. Just because our man of God is not present doesn't mean that we don't carry on and do what we're supposed to do. Come on, somebody. We are supposed to gather ourselves deliberately. We're supposed to gather ourselves intently and intentionally to keep on doing the things that we know we're supposed to be doing. The Bible says that we're as we pray one for another, then we are also to prefer one another. Talk to me, somebody. We are supposed to keep on doing what we know to do. This is why the Lord said when he departed, he said, he said, I'm going to pray to the Father that he sends the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he won't talk about himself. He'll talk about me. So Jesus knew that that, that as he ascended, the Holy Spirit would descend and the, and the work would continue on. Just because Jesus ascended does not mean that we're not still here to do the work that we are supposed to be doing. Talk to me, somebody. So, so again, the essential things that we are supposed to be doing this morning is to carry on and keep on carrying on what we know we are supposed to be doing. So, yes, yeah, so let's, let's begin. Let's begin this morning off right. And and, and amen, Sister Yarbrough, we got to stay on the mission, amen. We got to stay on the mission. And we and we have to do exactly what Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20 said. We are supposed to go ye. Right now, we're going into places. The spirit of God is going into places this morning. Hallelujah. So let's keep the spirit of, of prayer, the spirit of worship, the spirit of, of uh, understanding. Let's keep the spirit going at this table. If there's nothing else I've learned, uh, and, and and Bishop and I was talking about this, and that is when we don't have morning manner like we are supposed to, people, you know, uh, I, I believe people are hungering for a, 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 a continuation of doing what we know works. Amen. So let's get our hearts ready this morning, praise God, and let us enter into the Holy of Holies in and around prayer. So whatever your prayer requests are, let's make sure that we put them there. Amen. And uh, I, I may not see them, but you know you put them there. And we're going to believe, we're going to believe in the power of God this morning that what we're going to ask God for, that he's going to deliver. Amen. Again, I say, if you cannot believe in the one you're praying to, then don't, you know, don't expect, don't expect God to answer when you don't even believe in him. He is the one who answers prayer. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts, beloved. Let us prepare our hearts this morning uh, around this prayer time. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to lift up our granddaughter Therese this morning. Hallelujah. We're going to lift that up before the Lord. Yes, Sister Peters, God bless you. We're going to lift, lift up granddaughter Therese this morning. Hallelujah. We're going to lift up one another in prayer this morning. I'm being deliberate right now. I want to be, let us be deliberate. Let us, whatever we put in this chat, we're going to be praying for this morning. Whatever your prayer needs are, we're going to put out there. And we're going to say, yes, yes, Sister Carter, have your way, Holy Spirit, at this table. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to pray for Robert Aaron and the Aaron family. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, Lady Tinsley, lifting up one another at this table. We're going to lift up one another. We're going to lift up one another at this table. Hallelujah. Let us go before our maker right now. Father God, we thank you. We praise your name, God. Father, we come into your presence right now with joy, glee, and gladness. Father, your word tells us that to enter our courts 
your courts with thanksgiving and then into the, the holy of holies, oh God. We're going to enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, God. We're, we're coming in right now, God. We're coming into this place. And Father, before we ask you for anything, God, before we petition the throne, before we pull on the anointing of heaven itself, we're going to say, Father God, forgive us. Forgive us of the things we have thought. Forgive us of the things we have said. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, of the things we've done. Lord, we know that these things are not of you. If we've done these things with ill intent, if we've done these things with malice of heart, if we've done this thing with evil in our spirit, oh God. Father God, we're saying take them out right now. We're saying, God, remove these things because, Lord, we know that we, these things do not please you. What we do know, Lord, is this. Your word says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, you make even their enemies to leave them alone. So, God, we come before your throne this morning with this heart in mind that we're here to please you this morning, God. We're not here for fashion. We're not here for fame and nor are we here for show. But, God, we have set ourselves at this table. We come to this prayer time, God, to reach and touch. We come to this table to reach and touch you, God. You promised in your word if we gather ourselves in your name, you'd be in the midst of them. So, Father God, we thank you for being here this morning with us. We thank you, Lord, that last night was, our, was not our last night. But, Lord, you touched us this morning with the finger of your love. You moved us. You stirred us. Somebody looked down at their feet, their feet moved. Somebody looked at their legs, their legs moved. Somebody reached over with their arms and the, they realized their arms were moving. And then somebody got opened their eyes and realized they were still in the land of the here and now. Oh God, we're looking forward to the day that we're in the land of the living, which is where you are, God. We're going to live with you eternally, Father God. But Lord, right now, in this world in which we live, God, we're, we're saying, Father, have your way. We, lived up, we lift up Therese to you right now, God. Lord, touch that grandchild. Touch that grandchild right now, God, from the crown of head to the, to the very bottom of the feet, oh God. Oh Lord, not only on the outside, but God, go into the inside of Therese, God. Touch that body, God, as only you can. Touch the Aaron family this morning, Lord God. Oh Father, touch everyone. Touch every prayer request that have been laid on this altar this morning, Lord God. Father, we know that you can answer prayer. Lord Jesus, we know that you're the prayer answering Lord. Holy Spirit, we know that you can move things. And so we come before the God, the only, the only divine one of heaven itself. The only one whose the word says, whose the heaven is his throne room and the earth is his switch to. Oh God, we come to you this morning. We bow our spirit. We bow our hearts to you this morning, Lord God. That you would move, oh God, as only you can. Lord, knowing that you could do anything, God. And one thing we know that you won't do is fail. You never fail. Lord, just as your word says, and you were talking to Joshua. You said, Joshua, just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Yes, God, you are the same God. Matter of fact, your word says you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I know because your word says this, and I believe it, God. And therefore, God, you're the same God yesterday, today, right now, this very moment, God. You are our God. And we embrace you right now as our God. You are the God not only of the Jew, but also the Gentile. And so, God, we are the Gentile, and Lord, you have promised that we have the same access. We have the same privilege. We have the same resource. And God, you are our source. And thank you, Lord God, as we sit at this table, believe in God that your word, that you would answer according to your word. Father, we thank you for being our God. And Lord, realizing that everything that we're doing right now, everything that we're going through, hearts are kind of disturbed, oh God. People looking around and they're realizing that things that they once could, could go to the store and get things, the shelves might be a little empty or, or baby formula, oh God, is not available to, to mothers who need to feed their children. Oh God, there's some things going on, but your word has always been true. You said in these last days that we would experience things like never before. 
And Father, I know that people at this table, oh God, they believe in you. And they're not letting the things of the world disturb them, God, because they trust in you. Your word says in Isaiah 26 and 3, you said you'd keep our, you'd keep our minds. If we keep our minds stayed on you, God, you'd keep us in perfect peace. And Lord, our minds this morning, our minds are staying on you, God. Our hearts are staying on you, God. Father, I don't know, I don't know what everybody needs, but God, I know one thing that everybody needs, and they need you. Lord, we need you, God. We need you, God, and we petition you right now. You're the one who can change the hearts of kings and queens. You're the one who can move presidents and, prem and premiers. You're the one, oh God, who can go into nations and change nations. You're the one who can change the course of many waters. You're the one. You're the one who can turn things around when things are going bad. You're the one. Oh, Father, and we humble ourselves at the throne this morning. We humble ourselves at your feet, Lord God. Father, we're saying have your way at the table. We're saying have your way in the lives of these men and women because, God, they're praying for one another. They're praying for a loved one at this table, somebody incarcerated, somebody sitting behind prison bars. But God, just as you was with Paul and Silas, you can go into those prisons. You can go into those jail cells. You can set captivity free this morning. Lord, they may feel trapped, but we hear your word that says who you set free is indeed free. So Lord, set them free this morning. Free them up, oh God. Let them know, God, that though they may be in a situation, they may be in a place, oh God, but that place do not define who they are. Oh God, touch them this morning. Oh God, touch them this morning that are sitting in those places. Oh, Lord, we're saying go into the courtrooms, somebody's child, somebody's, somebody's son or daughter, somebody's loved one. So they're getting ready to go before the judge. And God, they, they, they have been accused wrongly, but God, you're able to turn the sentence around. You're able to go and become the judge of judges. You're able to sit on the high court. You're able to move hearts and minds. Oh, Lord, there's a disturbance going on in the world right now. Your word, your word is becoming more real to us. You said in these last days, there would be wars and rumors of wars, that there'd be earthquakes in strange places, that there'd be famine throughout different lands. Oh, God, your word is coming to pass. Some of us didn't realize we'd see these times in, in which we live in, but God, we're living in these times. But one thing I know about you, God, and I know the people at this table know, is that you are merciful, God. You're merciful. From generation to generation, we realize that you are merciful, God. And Lord, we know that follows mercy is your grace. We know you to be gracious. We know you, we know you're God of grace. We know that you're God of grace. So, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for your loving kindness. Oh, God, have mercy this morning. Somebody's loved one been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Oh, but God, you're able. You're able, oh God, to give that, that cancer. Oh, you, you can dismiss it if you choose, God. You can, you can remove it if you choose to, God. And this is why we pray according to your will. And Lord, I remember my own brother this morning when I used that word cancer. Oh Lord, how you're sustaining him. How you're sustaining him, God. And how it is, oh God, that I'm able to spend time with him on the phone and encourage him week after week, God. How he faced bravely, oh God, the inevitable. And I said to you again, God, if you choose, God, to remove it, we're praying, God, according to your will. I simply ask God not to be selfish. I said, Lord, if you choose. I have to be like David as he was at the bedside of his son, knowing that you'd already pronounced a decision. But he said, if by chance, if by chance you would move it, if by chance you would deliver my son, 
And I'm saying, God, if it be your will, if it be your will, you can turn it around. But Lord, I know he has great encouragement because he believes in you. He knows, God, that there's a better place. He knows that there's a better body waiting on him. He knows that there's a place that is free from sickness, free from disease, free from hurt, harm, and danger, free from all of these things. And God, that's our will, is that you give him what you want him to have, God. And Father God, forgive me if I had to be a little selfish this morning. But Lord, I know I'm not the only one. Somebody else at this table has a situation just like mine. And we're saying, God, move. Move as only you can move. You said, speak those things that are not according to, you were talking to Abraham. You, Abraham had to see things that were not necessarily in front of him. But God, we're saying, we're going to speak those things that were not as though they were. Lord, count it unto us righteous, oh God. Let us see, oh God, your hand move. We know that you're a miracle working God. We know that you can make miracles happen. We know, God, that you can manifest miracles in our lives. And Lord, miracles are those things that are unexplainable by the human mind. And Lord, I don't know how you do it. I don't care how you do it. All I know is that you know to do it. All I know at this table this morning that you can do it. All I know, God, is that you're God that don't make mistakes. Oh, God, so touch, touch your oh God, the men. Touch, oh God, the men and women at this table this morning. Touch the men and women at this table this morning, dear God. Move, oh God, so that we can understand, Lord, that everything is happening according to your divine will, according to your divine purpose. Oh God, do it for us. Move, God, at this table this morning. Oh Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon the men and women of God. And Father, that, 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 that loved one, oh God, that loved one that is in that hospital bed right now, and the doctors done gave up, the doctors that said, I done done all that we can do. They're, 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 they're saying the best thing right now is to put them, to just to give them some medication to, to comfort them. But God, I still believe. I'm believing on behalf of the people of God at this table that God, you can still do it. You can lift that person out of that sick bed. You can get that sickness and send it back to whence it came. And you let us know, God, that you're still, you're still able, God. So, Father, I thank you this morning at this table. I thank you this morning at this table, God, that every good gift and every perfect gift that comes from you, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you this morning. We're acknowledging, God, that, that, that we are not all that we should be right now. But, God, you're still an able God. God, that you can move mountains. We know, God, that you can move mountains. We know, God, that you can move mountains. So, Lord, move mountains out of our lives right now. Move mountains out of our lives right now. Move those mountains out of our lives right now. Move these things that are not of you, God. Move these things, oh God, that are, that are hold us back. So God, we're saying, have your way this morning. Father, have your way. Guide us by your hand this morning, Lord God. Send forth your anointing at this table this morning. Lord, feed us the manner that only you can. Give us the angelic food as, that, that we need, oh God, to be sustained thereby. Oh God, give it to us right now. Shower down, God. Shower down, God. Let the song that, that says amazing grace, how sweet it sounds, that saved a rich like me. We were once lost, but now we're found. We were once blind, but now we see. Oh, God, thank you for opening blinded eyes. Thanking you, oh, God, for opening muted ears. Thanking you, oh, God, for giving us a mouth to speak, God, your word. Oh, Lord, let us be able to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Let us be able to show it in our lives. Let us be the men and women of God that you call us to be. Lord, you call us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Oh, God, have your way at this table. Lord, we lift up one another. We lift up each other. We know not what we ought to be praying for God, but we know that the Holy Spirit, he steps in, he comes in and he begins to speak things, oh God, 
in the groanings of our human spirit, it begins to translate. He began to translate those things between earth and heaven. He's the one letting you know, Father God. He's the one that letting you know, Lord Jesus. He's the one that's speaking on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God, that you're doing things, that, you, that you're still performing great and wondrous things in our lives. And so, Father, I thank you this morning that you have not left us. We thank you, God, that you have not forsaken us. We thank you, Lord, that you're still doing those things that we need. Father, feed the masses as only you can, God. Feed the masses. How it is, Lord, that you were able to take two fish and five loaves of bread? On one hand, you fed 5,000. On another hand, you fed 4,000. But, Lord, you are amazing to us. So, Lord, we but need to be trusting in you. That's what we need to be doing this morning. We need to come this morning with a trusting heart. Your word says to trust in you and lean not to our own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 reminds us that we're to put our trust squarely in you. And we're not going to lean to our own understanding this morning, not at this table. But in all of our ways, oh God, we're going to acknowledge you and we're confident, we're convinced that you're going to direct us. You're going to orchestrate things in our lives. You're going to move things that doesn't need to be there. You're going to rearrange things the way that things need to be arranged in our lives. You're going to do it your way, God. And we're saying that. We're saying that at this table this morning. We're saying, have your way, God. Have your way in our lives. Oh, Lord, rearrange our minds. We are, rearrange our spirits, God. Lord, we don't just want to be well, we want to be made whole. Make us whole, oh God. So whoever needs to be made whole at this table, oh God, make them whole. Whoever's praying for someone to be made whole, make them whole, God. Let it be done according to your will. Let it be done according to your divine purpose. And we know, God, that you're an omniscient God. There's not a single thing that you are not aware of. There's not a single thing that is going on in our lives that you are not allowing. You're an omnipotent God with the power, the exousia. Thank you, Lord, for the dunamis of who you are. Oh, Lord, shake things up where they need to be shaken. Strip things away that need to be stripped away from us. And guide us by your eyes, Lord. Guide us this morning at this table. And we're giving you praise, oh God. We're giving you praise not only with our lips, God, but we're giving you praise in our spirit. Our spirits are praising you, God. Our spirits are rejoicing this morning. Our hearts are rejoicing this morning because we believe that what we ask for in your name, you are going to do it. Yes, God, we believe. We touch and agree. We come into an alignment with your word. We say, Lord, let it be done according to your spirit. Lord, we just praise you. We just honor you. We just acknowledge and exalt you. We extol you, God. Everyone, God, at this table. Lord, we're excited to know that we serve the king of kings the Lord of Lords. We are excited to know that we serve an omnipresent God, one who can, who can be here in Arizona, one who can be there in, on the East Coast, one who can be there in Texas, one who can be there uh, in, in Canada, one who can be there in Mexico, one who can be there in Ukraine, one who can be there in Russia. I mean, God, you're able to be everywhere. Answering prayer, meeting needs, you can do it, God. So, Father God, we thank you that every element at this table, oh God, let it be met in our prayers. Father, some of us, not only are we praying, God, but we're also fasting. Lord, we honor you in our fast. We honor you in our fast, God, because we discipline not only our physical bodies, but we discipline our spiritual bodies. We're saying, let the spirit of God take control. 
We're saying let the spirit of God reign supreme. We're letting the spirit of God overshadow, overtake us. We're letting the spirit of God guide us. And so, Father, then I hear your word tells us in Isaiah 40 and 31 that they that wait upon you, Lord, shall renew their strength. Hallelujah. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles. They're going to run and not be weary. They're going to walk and not faint in the Lord. Oh, God, I thank you this morning. Oh, God, I praise you on behalf of these, your people, that you'd move upon each and every prayer request, that you would answer according to your will and according to your purpose, that you would do it, oh, God, as only you can. You tell us in your word that we're to consider the lilies of the field, how they do not toil or spin, but yet King Solomon was not more beautifully arrayed than that. Then, God, you tell us to consider the birds of the air, how they do not gather food into barns, and yet not one of them goes hungry, and not one falls from the sky without your knowledge. And then the question comes, how much more are we, how much more important do we think we are to the Father than these things? And if you prefer and consider those things, Father God, if these things, Lord Jesus, are important to you, then I know we're way more important than that. So God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the prayers of the righteous. According to James chapter five, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. So Lord, thank you for answering prayer. We're going to believe that what we have petitioned you for is already done. We're going to speak it. We're going to say it. And we're going to hold on to it. That what we have come before you this morning with. We've laid it at the altar. We've said only you can do this God. We've held on it. We've held on to it long enough. But we're letting go this morning. We're releasing it into the atmosphere. We're saying take our prayer needs. And answer them, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And the saints of God say amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let's give God some praise, people of God. Let's give God some praise, people of God. Let's give God some praise. Tell God, thank you that it's already done. Tell the Lord that you believe it's already done. You got to, you got to, let me tell you like this. You have to faith it until it happens. Come on, somebody. You have to faith it until it happens. You have to learn that. The, the faith that you started out with, it, it should have grown by now. You have to faith it until it happens. Come on. You got to faith it until it happens. We go, we're we growing from faith to faith. If God did it once, he'll do it again. If he did it in a little thing, he'll do it in something bigger. I'm telling you, you have to faith it until it happens. So let's give God some praise this morning, believing that we're going to receive Whatever, whatsoever we are asking him for, amen, we have to believe that what we're asking God for, we're going to receive. Say that with me. We're, we need to believe that what we're asking God for, we are going to receive. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. We need to get ourselves ready. Today, today, amen, not only is it uh, morning manna, uh, prayer time, but it's also time for communion. Amen. Today is the, this is our Wednesday communion time. This is our Wednesday communion time. We thank God that we're able to do this. The Bible says as often as we do it, we are to do it in remembrance of him. So let us, let us get ready to uh, have our communion. But I'm going to say again, please, beloved, please, whatever you do, don't forget, you have to faith. You have to have faith in God. Come on, somebody. You have to have faith in God to know that what he is going to, uh, what you're asking for, that he is going to deliver it according to his will. Um, uh, and, and, and thank you. Thank you, Sister Swenson. Amen. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, woman of God. Uh, that's right. We have to encourage one another at this table. Everybody. Tags, titles, and credentials. Tags, titles, and credentials. Those things mean nothing unless you are trusting in the Lord God Almighty. We have to strip ourselves of these uh, positional stuff and start realizing that uh, you are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, amen. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we do honor positions. We honor that. Don't forget, don't think I, I, I'm, I'm saying something that is contentious. We honor those people that are placed in positions and, and authorities over us. But at the same time, don't forget, it is not about the position. It is about our heart's condition. Let me say that again. It's not about our position. It is about our heart's condition. If our, if our hearts are conditioned right, then we should see righteousness coming forth. So we praise God for each and every one of you. But, but amen, we, we need to get ourselves ready. We, we need to get ourselves ready for our time in, in fellowship around, around the, the, uh, the elements of, of God, the, the holy sacraments. Uh, as, as you and I both know, Bishop, Bishop Bedden and I, we, we, hold, we hold sacred the things of God when it comes to um, communing with the Lord. These things are not just things we go through, but uh, communion is very important. So let us get our hearts ready. Praise God. Amen. Amen. This is our time to commune with God. This is our communion time. Amen. The Bible tells us that on the Lord, on the night that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he was praying, broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. The apostle Paul writes and he says that as oft as we do this, as many times as we do this, we can do this, we can do this seven days a week. It's as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of him. Amen. Let us remember that our Lord's broken body, our Lord's broken body, how he was, how he was abused and misused, how he was treated. So let us take this broken body into our body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We remember. Lord, we remember. We remember. And then scripture says, after the same manner also, he took the cup after sup, saying, that this is the New Testament in my blood. It is for the remission of sin. It is for the remission of sin. And then again, the apostle Paul, he, he comes in 1 Corinthians and he writes, as oft as we do this, let us do this in remembrance of him. Amen, beloved. Amen. Again, we thank God this morning. We thank God for being able to partake in the communion of God. We're, we're able to participate, amen, in the very things of God. Listen again. We're able to participate in the very things of God. And so we realize that it is only because of what the Lord did on the cross of Calvary that we're able to experience this relationship that we have now with heaven itself. And it's because of what the Lord Jesus did for us. Amen. It is because of what the Lord did, Lord did for us. Again, praise God for you. Amen. 
Uh, it is time for us for our morning matter. Praise the Lord. It is time for us to get our hearts and minds ready for our morning matter. Praise the Lord. And so we are going to prepare ourselves, amen, to do just that. And so uh, when you and I, when you and I, I put something, I put something out on uh, Facebook just recently. When you and I think about uh, the kingdom and we're serving the king, amen, we know that the enemy do not like, the enemy do not like us for doing just that. But this morning, the Lord gave me something to give to you, and I want us to get ready for that, amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, remember Bishop said on Monday, I said on Monday, I said if you, when we come to this table, we need to come with pen, we need to come with paper, and we need to come with the word of God. Those things are important. We need to come with pen, paper, and the word of God. So let's get our Bibles ready. I know many of you all are disciplined, but uh, we want to say uh, good morning. We want to say good morning to our first-time visitors. Amen. If you're the if you're a first-time visitor, praise God. We thank God for you. Praise God. We thank God for you. You could have been somewhere else. We hope and also pray that uh, you you know you first-time visitors. Amen. Somebody that that is uh, have come to this table all the time that they have liked they have, they tag and they share this. So we're praying that somebody shared this with you to say, hey, come to this table because there's some good food at it. So we believe this morning that you have somehow or another came here, arrived at this place, not by accident, not by coincidence, not by chance, not by happenstance, but it was because of God's divine providence that you're at this table this morning. Come on, somebody. I'm going to say it again. It's not by chance. It's not by happenstance. It's not by incident or coincident. It is by God's divine providence that you and I are sitting at this table and that we are deliberately, we're deliberately seeking God. We are saying to God, Father, I'm going to be intentional because you're intentional with us. We're going to be intentional with God. Come on, talk to me, somebody. We must know that what we're doing is carrying out the clarion call, doing what God has mandated, has ordained us to do, and that is to share his word. The mission, the mission statement, I tell people this all the time, beloved, the mission statement is in Matthew 28. It is a not only a mission statement, but is the commission. So the mission is there, the commission is there. We cannot go and come, we cannot commission anyone without a mission. We, can, we, we cannot be commissioned to do anything without there being a mission. So we thank God this morning for each and every one of you. So again, first time visitors, amen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the morning manna ministry table. I am yours truly, Bishop Simpson, out here in the great state of Arizona, praise God. I have to get up early, amen, to be here at your 730 on the East Coast. It's 430 here on uh, in my time zone. So you better believe I am, I am, I'm so, listen, I so love doing what God has called me to do that it, it might, you might say, I, Bishop, there's no way that I can get up that early. Listen, when you are doing God's work, God's time is your time. Your time is not God's time. God's time should be your time. Not your time should be God's time. We have this thing so messed up. And I want us to make sure that we start understanding that we have to always, the Bible says, whenever asked, always be ready to give an answer to the hope that lies within you. So we thank God. Amen. Today, however, again, uh, we want to we want to talk about this, this roaring lion thing. We want to talk about this roaring lion thing. Amen. This roaring lion concept. I asked the question, and, and, and that was to prep our hearts this morning for where I believe the Lord wants to take us. Um, the question is, are we more afraid of the sound of the lion or are we afraid of the sight of the lion? So it is a question uh, that, I, uh, that I have this morning, and I, and, and, and I want to 
pose it and I want to put it on your hearts this morning to see, to get your thought, to get, let, let's have some discussion is what I said. I want to have some discussion in and around that concept. I want to give, I want to put some thought in and around that concept. And so if uh, those who have your word ready, amen, look at somebody, you know, tell yourself I'm word ready, Bishop, I'm word ready. And so we're going to go to uh, the book of First Peter. This is where we're going to arrive at. We're going to go to the book of First Peter, chapter five. Amen. First Peter, chapter five. In First Peter, chapter five, is where we're going to where we're going to start this at today. This roaring lion concept. Amen. The question on the heart at this table today: Are we more fearful? Are we more scared? Are we more afraid of the sound of the lion? Or are we more afraid of the sight of the lion? Now, as we get started this morning, 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. So, so I just want to throw this out there. There are thousands and thousands upon thousands of good ideas in the world. Now, and I'm going to tell you one that's not a good thought. Though. Here's what's not a good idea. To enter into a lion's den, to go into a lion's lair, to go into a lion's territory. I will tell you, that's not a good idea. It was back in 2019, beloved. Um, there was a there was a young man. He was 24 years of age, and this 24 year uh, this 24 year old young man, he was working in uh, Hamburg, Germany, uh, the the zoo that is in Hamburg, Germany, and he went into uh, the lions area at the zoo to check the fence, but what he forgot to do was to check to see if the lions were in their cages. He went in checking the fence, the lions were eating. A couple of them realized that something had entered into their domain and they went and attacked this young man. They mauled him, but not to death. A couple of his uh, coworkers came to his aid and were able to snatch this young man out of the grips of the lions and, uh, and from the grips of death. If it were not for them, that young man would not have made it. He would not have made it. And so uh, these lions, they pounced on him. They attacked this young man. This young man had some serious injuries as a result of what he had did. So uh, needless to say, long story short, let me say it like this. Lions are dangerous, whether they are in the wild or whether they're in zoo uh, areas, confinements, Lions are dangerous things. Lions are going to always do what lions are always designed to do. They are, they are territorial and they'll always fight anything that will challenge them. Not to mention they are natural hunters. They, are in, they, they have an instinct to hunt and, and they can reach up to speeds. Watch this. They can reach up to speeds of some 50 miles per hour. I don't know about you. I don't run that fast. I used to run pretty fast when I was younger. I was in the military. So I used to I used to run pretty good when I was in the military. I, I, I had I had back then, uh, don't get jealous, some of the, some of those who were in the military like I was. I, I had a I had a what they call a, a pretty good nine minute pace. And I, I was, you know, I ran track when I was in, in high school. So so I had a good disciplined body to do certain things. But let me say it like this. I don't run as fast as I used to. The text I want us to turn our attentions to here in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to we're going to read, first of all, how it begins. It begins in verse 1. It says, the elders which are among you. This is someone that you and I know. This is someone you and I are familiar with. These are elders. Peter here is talking to people that are in the fold, people that are brothers and sisters. So he says, to the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse two, catch it. Feed the flock which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as lords, 
over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, on the mighty hand of God that you may be, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I stop there. So let's park our understanding at this point this morning, beloved. Let's park our understanding right here. Here we began the discussion. Another bad idea is this. Walking around as a Christian unaware. Listen to me. Another bad idea. I told you the first bad idea. Don't go into a lion's area. Don't go into a lion's den. Don't go into a lion's domain. Another bad idea is as a Christian that we go around walking around unaware of the fact that a more dangerous enemy is lurking around. We're walking around prancing as if we have no care in the world, as if, as if we don't have nothing to be vigilant about. If that were the case, I'm wondering why in verse eight, the apostle Peter says, be sober. And we're gonna break this down. He says, be sober. He says, be vigilant. Those are things that tells us we need to pay attention to our domain. Sadly to say, we, we, we go into, when we go visiting uh, cities or we go on vacations, we tend to think that we're back home somewhere and we lose all sense and sensibility that we need to be on our guard. We need to be watchful. Beloved, let me tell you something. Christians need to get their vigilant minds. We need to get our vigilant. We need to get our vigilance back. We need to make sure that we're sober, but we're so drunk on power. It says be sober. We're so drunk on power. We're so drunk on position. We're so drunk on so many things that we're losing what the, what this word is talking about. And we're going to get into this. And we may finish today. And if not, Tell somebody we got Friday coming. Bishop might have to, we might have to move some stuff to Friday. But I'm telling you, a bad idea this morning is that as a Christian, that we're walking around and we're unaware of the fact that a more dangerous enemy is lurking, waiting to chow down on your life. He is, the, he, I'm going I'm to share some stuff with you because I, I, I'm a, I am a, I'm a National Geographic enthusiast. I love watching the National Geographic channel. So that's a little tidbit of, about how, you know, what Bishop thinks about. But Peter here, he gave us, Peter gave us a firm warning, Sister Tinsley. He gave us a firm warning to be sober minded, to be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, Peter says that, Peter's in essence saying here that, that Satan wants to devour us. Satan wants to destroy us. Just like a roaring lion who is on the hunt always. Now, here's something that you might not know about a lion. Lions simply kill for the sake of killing. They don't, they, they sometimes kill to eat, but sometimes lions simply kill for the sake of killing. It is instinctive for them to do it. And if you think the devil is any different, then you don't know your enemy. And I, and I believe God gave us this so that we can start understanding that we cannot, we cannot walk around as if we don't realize that there is an enemy. And we need to be sober. I, again, 
I don't believe, I really don't believe that 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 that, that the Lord would have that would have prompted Peter to write this if there was not something that you and I needed to be doing. He says to be sober minded, to be vigilant. And we're going to get into this a little bit deeper. Amen. Jesus said in John's gospel, 10th chapter, 10th verse, catch this, write this down, beloved. The Bible says the thief, the thief, you can give the devil any name you want to, but I'm telling you, the Bible says the thief, if you put the word lion there, the lion only comes that he might steal. I know it says thief, but I'm telling you, look at the characteristics. The lion will steal. The lion will kill and the lion will destroy. This is the MO of the lion. He is a fake lion of Judah. See, the lion of Judah is not like this lion. This is a this lion here, this lion's instinct is to kill, steal, and destroy. I, I know you probably didn't think about it like that, but I'm telling you, this lion is the same lion. The lion is a thief. The lion is a thief because the lion will see another, a, a, another, uh, 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 what we call predator than kill something. The lion will go and take it from whatever it was. And, and matter of fact, one of the, one of the greatest enemies, uh, uh, to, to, uh, the kingdom. If you talk about the animal kingdom, lions do not like hyenas. If a hyena and hyenas don't like lions, and you will find out that lions will go and they will simply kill for the sake of killing. Are y'all praying with me? Lions are going to do what lions always does. So comparing, comparing the devil to a lion suggests at least four things. And I want us to capture this. I want you to get your notes ready. I want you to get ready to receive this. But there, there are four things between nature and how the lions work. There's four things I want to explore, but I want to run down this list first and foremost about what I know, what I have observed, what I have learned, what I have uh, uh, studied as it relates to a lion. Number one, lions, they blend in with their surroundings. When they're on the hunt, lions blend in with their surroundings. I want you to get that. Lions blend in the coat of the lion, the lion's coat, if you will. In other words, they're, they're, the, 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 the fur of them, it is very similar to the surroundings. And it, it's hard for, it's, it's hard for the, the, the prey, if you will, to see the predator because they blend in. They blend in. You said, Bishop, why does that make, why are you emphasizing that? Because the scripture says that the lion is similar to the wolf. The, the Bible says that, that we have wolves in sheep clothing, which means they blend in. In what you need to capture is who Peter was talking to. Peter was talking to the house of God. Peter was talking to the believers. Peter was talking to, let's put it like this. He was talking to the church. Which means, don't get disturbed by what I'm about to say, which means there might be some lions right in the church. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, get that, get that. Now, there might be some lions in your area. There might be some lions standing in the pulpit. There might be some lions in, in some, of these, some of these positions. We, we, it's only when they do what they always do. So I'm going to say again, lions blend in when they're on the hunt. This warning was given to the church. Peter was given this warning. He was talking to the elders. He said, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. He says, I'm an elder too. And he goes into and he begins to tell them what not to do. He says, he, he tells them what to do first. He says, feed the flock, not feed on the flock. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. He said to feed the flock, not to feed 
on the fly. Next thing that you need to understand, lions are not just male. They're male and what? Female. It is the female lions that do most of the hunting. <laughs> yes, I said that. Female lions do the majority of the hunting. The male lions usually wait until the female lions have attacked and pounced on the prey and have taken it down if it's if that prey is weak enough the male lions don't have to intervene it's only when the 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 prey is too big for the female lions to take down when the male lions will show up and help assist in bringing it down all right let's get that understanding see oftentimes we 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 are, we're we're only watching one gender that's preying on something in the house of worship, not realizing that we have the male and females on the hunt in and around the house of God. Say again, there are male and female lions on the hunt in and around the house of God. Mm. The male lions, they tend to hang around and protect the female lions when necessary. If too, if 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 the, if what's threatening the, the the pride is too much for the male lions, he might run off and leave the females to fend for themselves. In other words, there's no there's no love loss among thieves, because remember they have a mentality to do just what lions always do. I'm going to go back again. In verse 2 of 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Feed the flock of God. See, a, a metaphor here, as I, look at, as I look at my word, is that our Lord himself has employed the, the, the shepherds to do the feeding. He's put elders in place to do the feeding. You and I both know, beloved, that in some places of worship, the elders have taken on themselves not to look at the people as the people should be looked upon. The people should be viewed as sons and daughters. And if you look at them as sons and daughters, you won't look at them as meat to be preyed upon. Rather than praying for them, we're praying on them. Whether they're P-R-A-Y-I-N-G for them, we're P-R-E-Y-I-N-G on them. We need to realize why God placed you elders and, had, and we need to understand why elders are placed over us in among us so that they are supposed to be doing this. They are supposed to be feeding us. Jeremiah 3.15 tells us that God says, I give you shepherds after my heart who will feed you with wisdom and understanding. Come on, talk to me, beloved. God says, I give you shepherds after my heart who will feed you with wisdom and understanding. When, when that shepherd, when that, when that person, that elder, when that person is not guarding you, that person is now preying on you. That, that, that person is supposed to be there to guard you. The Bible lets us know that we're to take the oversight. So when I see this, when we're looking at the word of God, when we're understanding what God is wanting us to understand, what we need to be doing at this table, beloved, is being we're being taught to be vigilant. We're taught to be aware. We're taught to take this word and start applying it to our lives so that we're not off guard, that we're always on guard. We are always on guard. We're not off guard. If I look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, and, 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 and you all, some of you all know this, when you look at that word, it tells us that we are to be watchers on the wall, that we are to be watchers on the wall, so that we are always watchful to see the approach of the enemy. 
And, and I'm going to say this. The enemy knows how to approach you. The enemy stalks. The lion stalks. The lion does. The lion is looking first for the weak one among us. The weak one. The W-E-A-K. The lion is looking for the weak one among us. Are y'all praying with me? The lion is looking for the weak one among us. Now, here's what here's what's interesting about you know being weak. The Bible says, "When I am weak, then am I made strong." And it's it is about it's about realizing that it is not my strength that's going to get me through this life. It is me relying upon the strength of my life. The Bible says, "For the joy of the Lord is my strength." I need to I need to trust in God and not trust in myself. The scripture tells us to put not our trust in man. Last time I checked, beloved, that's you and I, which means I shouldn't even be trusted myself. I shouldn't even trust myself, but I am to trust in the Lord. The Lord knows I'm supposed to trust him. Again, the lion, Sister Tinsley, is looking for the weak ones. He is looking for the weak ones. She is looking for the weak ones. The lion is. And so when I look at this also, another thing, a lion can turn and devour their own if necessary. A lion can turn on their own and devour them if necessary. Help me, Holy Ghost. The lion does not care who it eats. The lion does not care what it kills. The lion is going to do what a lion does. When a lion takes over the pride, when the lion, the male lion takes over the pride, he will go and kill the babies of the previous lion leader, the, lead, the, the previous male lion. The lion does this because instinctively, he does not want his competition to grow up in and among. So he will kill all of the, of the offspring of the previous male lion. And then he would make sure that he brings up, impregnates and brings up those of himself so that he is not threatened by the offspring of the previous king of the lions. I want you to get this. I want. I really want you to understand our enemy, because what I'm describing, what I'm describing, is the nature of the devil. If you miss this, I'm describing the characteristics of the devil. The Lord laid out some characteristics of the enemy, and I'm. It's sad to say that Christians have forgotten that this is in the word. We read it, we've read it, and yet we just gloss over it as if it doesn't mean anything. The Lord was strategic, beloved, and he gave us characteristics to look out for when it comes to lions in and around the house of worship. I said that. We are to be watchful. We are to be on our guard because there are lions lurking around the house of worship. The lions are closer than we think. So when I said that, when I asked you, are you more scared of the sound of the lion or are you scared of the sight of the lion? I just asked the question. It's food for thought. It is worth this. I believe it is worth discussing at this table. So let me say then, I, I said, we're going to suggest that there are four things to compare between the lion and nature and the devil himself. First thing, the devil wants to consume us as lions consume their prey. Lions wants to consume us just as they want to consume their prey. See, lions hunt by staying hidden. So their prey will be inattentive. When we, when we, when we take our attention, we think we're safe. We, we, don't, we don't think we have anything to be concerned about. So, so 
when we become inter inattentive to the lion's presence because we're not watchful as we should see once the, see once the lion gets close enough to the unsuspecting prey you better believe they will begin to chase after you there are some things that you and I hear about that is happening in the body of Christ, in the body of believers, and, and it has become so normalized that it has become acceptable, in other words, that we don't tend to think that we need to go somewhere else. See, if, if, if this is happening in this church where there are lions preying on the people of God, then you need to get out of this area because this is dangerous territory, especially if the lion pride is on the prowl. Now, you probably said, Bishop, you lost me. You lost me. Let me tell you what I'm talking about there. When, when the shepherd becomes the lion and has stopped being the shepherd, you're in a dangerous place. You're in a dangerous place because if, if the elders in and around are okay with what the used to be shepherd, which has now become the lion is doing, then they also have become a part of the what? Pride. They are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. They are allowing things that should not happen in the place where you should feel safe. Y'all not talking to me. You should feel safe in the house of God. You should not be worried about the man or, or woman of God who have been placed as your shepherd. When the elders that are sitting there are not doing anything to get rid of that lion. I, 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 now don't, don't get me wrong when I say get rid of. What I mean is if they don't correct that lion, if they don't, if they don't get a check on that line, if they don't put a muzzle on that line, if they don't put that line in that cage where it needs to be until God converts it back to a shepherd, then you need you need to know you're in dangerous territory. Remember, I told you the lion is going to get close enough, close enough, and then when that nature changes to do what it was designed to do, you will see a different side of what that person says he or she is. I'm, I'm using he and she deliberately because it doesn't come in just one gender. It doesn't come in just one gender. So I'm saying to us at this table, let us be careful. Let us be careful because the lion is either going to wait for you to come to it and pounce on you or it will chase you down. That lion will chase you down. The devil, in the, in, in, and watch this, the lion will chase you down until it catches you. The lion will chase you down until it captures you. This is precisely what the devil does to believers. Beloved, the devil does the same thing to believers. The devil is always sometime hidden until that nature kicks in, and then next thing you know, it pounces on you. Or the devil waits until you come into range, and it pounces on you. Or it will chase you down and pounce on you, and it will grip you. It will catch you. Now watch this. The devil will disguise himself as an angel of light. If you don't believe me, let's go over to 1 Corinthians Let's go to 1 Corinthians, I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. I'm going to say it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope this is blessing you as it's blessing me. In that 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes in that 14th verse, he, here's what it says. He says, and no marvel. In other words, don't be surprised. In other words, don't let this come as a shocker to you. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15, therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers, ministers, plural, also be transformed 
as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. <laughs> yeah, it's in, it's in your Bible. It's in mine. What I'm trying to tell you, they can disguise themselves. They can put these collars on and they can sound, they can look, and they can act. But what they cannot disguise, catch this, they cannot disguise their heart. They cannot disguise their heart. Remember, I told you, Jeremiah 3.15 is clear. God says, I give you pastors. There's a distinction in our word. He says, I give you pastors after my heart who will feed you with wisdom and knowledge. Now, you say, well, Bishop, help me out here. I'm going to help you out. If I, your shepherd, who is a lion in sheep's, in other words, I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. If I am, if I am fat on your money, if I'm taking in your money, if I'm reaping in the rewards of being the shepherd, in other words, I am getting all of this in and you are you are barely making it. You are struggling. And I'm not doing it. I, you heard me say to this table, at this table, I said, before I take anything from you, I'm going to give to you. I should be adding to your life. If that shepherd is not adding to you, then all they're doing is taking, your, taking away your time. If you're showing up and you're not getting anything, if you're not being fed, I'm, I, I'm telling you, some of y'all may not like this. You, you all may not like this. But I'm telling you, you need to start, you need to become vigilant. You need to sober up. You need to, you need to get off of whatever drug that that person done bewitched you with. And you need to wake up and hear what the word of God says. See, we're drunk on, we're drunk on the charisma of a person. We get drunk. Oh, that, oh, uh, my man to God, he looks good. If that's what you're drunk on and you're caught up in what that person looks like, and not what they're giving you, not what they're feeding you. You need to check your sobriety because you might be drunk. You might be drunk on something that you need to stop drinking. Some of us have been drinking the Kool-Aid. We've been drinking the punch of some of these people that were placed over your house of worship. And they have been, they got you drunk. I'm just going to say it. They got you drunk. They got you drunk. Some, some of them are drunk on power. They got you drunk and they'll offer you, watch this, they'll offer you some power too and they'll have you drinking some of that. They, listen, listen, I'm I'm just here. I'm just here. Uh, Bishop Benton asked me to, to sit in for him and I, the first thing I told Bishop, I said, Bishop, um, I, sir, I thank you. I'm humbled that, that you would entrust me with your baby. I told Bishop that. I told him. I said, see, see the thing is with some of us, we, we don't know, we don't know when to stay where we're supposed to be. See, we don't know how to stay in our place. Y yes, Sister Vicky, we some people are manipulated. They are manipulated. Amen. They are manipulated, and they should not be manipulated. But it's because we don't lost we don't lost what we call our awareness factor. We have lost our um, vigilance. So I'm saying to us, let let's let's be careful. Let's be careful. I'm gonna tell you. Some of these people have, they have charmed their way into women's homes and have destroyed marriages. Yeah, I said that. They have charmed their way into women's homes and destroyed marriages. Some of these women have, 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 have uh, sashayed their way into homes and destroyed homes. So all I'm saying to you is don't get focused on the gender. No, I'm, I'm telling you, watch the characteristics of the lion. Watch the characteristics of the lion. So, so we go back. So we go back to 1 Peter. I mean, we go back to 1 Peter. And let me look at this again. He says to be sober. So, Second thing I want you to take away from this. A lion, like a lion, the devil attracts, or should I say, he's attracted to the weak. Like a lion, the devil is attracted to the weak. Now, have we checked our faith lately? I'm going to start asking, I'm going to ask a few questions. Have we checked our faith lately? In other words, is my faith weak? 
How weak am I when it comes to my faith? Am I weak in my prayer life? Do, do I pray as often as I should? And I'm going to tell you, when the Bible says pray without ceasing, I believe it. I believe that. We should be praying throughout the day. We should be certainly praying one for another. We should be praying always. The Bible tells us that we are to, that, that we are to always ought to pray. And next thing, am I weak in resisting temptation? When we're tempted, am I weak against that temptation? Whatever that temptation is, am I weak? Do I, do I find myself giving in? This right now is a time, we're in a time of self-examination. Every last one of us should be examining self. I know we love focusing on somebody else, but we need to take a look in that mirror and ask ourselves, am I, am I weak in my prayer life? Am I weak in my study of God's word? Am I weak in my meditation on God? Am I weak in my faith? Lord, in other words, self-examination has always been necessary. Self-examination is always necessary. The Bible even tells us, before you consider the speck that's in your brother's eye, consider the beam that's in yours. We should always be examining ourselves because I will tell you this morning when we were taking communion, one of the things that the apostle Paul tells us to do, let a man first examine himself. Before you take it, before we take that in, we're supposed to do a self-examination to see, am I worthy, God? And if I'm not worthy, we're supposed in that moment, in that self-examination, to say to God, Father, Lord, Holy Spirit, come into me, take up residence in me right now, Forgive me of what I've done. Forgive me of what I've said. Forgive me of what I've been thinking. Remove these things. Then, once we have done that, after this self-examination, after we've made our confession, then and then only are we supposed to move to the next level. And that is to take in. Now we have oneness in spirit with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Are y'all praying with me? Is, is this helping you out? Is, is any of this helping you out? I'm trying to help somebody. Now, normally, catch this, and then you heard me say this early. Normally, elephants do not mess with giraffes, Cape buffalo. Lions normally, now I'm saying that again, lions normally don't hunt large prey like giraffes and Cape buffalo and elephants. I said normally, they don't. I didn't say they don't. I said normally they don't. Just because I might be a bishop, just because you might be an apostle, just because you might be a pastor, just because you might be an elder, just because you might be a deacon. Just, the devil don't care how big you think you are. He will come at you when you least suspect him. See, the Bible, beloved, says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Some of us become so self-righteous that we lose focus on what it is that we have been placed in here to do. This is why I always tell people, when people say to me, thank you, Bishop, thank you. I said, no, thank God. Because I tell people, I said, I told God, I said, Lord, I would rather keep me humble than to have you humble me. <laughs> Glory to God. I would rather keep me humble than for God to humble me. The Lord says to humble myself. He told us to do that. He says to humble yourself. So trust me, when I tell God, I said, Lord, before I, before, I, before I let you humble me, I'm going to humble myself because I would rather know that when you humble me, 
Humble pie, I'm going to tell you what, I, 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 I've I ate that before in my life, and I'm going to tell you, humble pie is not good. It is not. It, it, it's hard to swallow it. But I'll tell you, when you humble yourself, when you humble yourself, because you decided to change your perspective about something. So, so lions, they go after the weak. They will chase down the weak. They will chase down... You know, things, lions, they chase down antelopes, zebras, uh, uh, you know, uh, hogs, you know, you name it. Those weaker things. And now, 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 now notice I said, just because the, the lion doesn't normally go after big game doesn't mean they don't go after it. See, even the lion knows that big game sometimes become lame. I said that. The lion knows big game sometimes become lame. In other words, they're not always strong. The lion is looking to see if there's a limp in the Cape Buffalo. The lion is looking to see if there's a limp in the elephant. The lion is looking to see if there's a limp in the giraffe. I told you, he doesn't normally go out, but the lion is looking for what? An opportunity. Just because... I said that he doesn't normally go after big game. He's looking for the lame in the big game. Yeah, I said that. The lion is looking for the big game. He's looking for the lame in the big game. And so he's going to take a chance, opportunity to get at you. Go with me, if you will, over to uh, the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. I, I pray, again, I'm saying, I pray that this is blessing you as it blessed me. See, uh, what... One thing I said on Monday is, I, I don't know what you're going to say to Bishop Ben when he gets back, but I, I hope you let Bishop know that, uh, you know, Bishop Simpson did the best he could under the circumstances he was left with. But I thank God for the, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. I said, go to Ephesians chapter number six. And we're going to, we're going to do a little bit of study here. Ephesians chapter number six, Ephesians six. Some of you all are very familiar with this. In Ephesians six, beginning around about verse number 10, it says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong where? In the Lord. If we if we don't stay strong in the Lord, we become big game weak. We begin, we become weak game. In other words, we might we might be in a, a high office, but because we're not staying strong in the Lord, we we are becoming weak. We are becoming weak, and the lion is watching. Let me give you some understanding because it's important. Sometimes leaders of churches, of houses of worship, rather, sometimes they, they get so high and mighty that they feel as if they cannot be brought down. They feel as if they're untouchable. I've said this and I'm going to share this with you. It has been said, and I and, and 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 I need to make sure that I quote it right. When we, you and I, get to a point where we think that we're untouchable, we're in what we call dangerous territory. When we get to a point where we think that we're unreachable, we're in dangerous territory. All I'm saying to you is, don't get to a point where you think you're untouchable and you start abusing power. So here's the thing. When you and I abuse the power of the position that we've been placed and we violate the trust that we've been entrusted with, we are setting ourselves up for what I call danger territory. We are becoming weak because we are no longer focusing on the Lord being our strength. We are becoming strong in ourselves. My mother had a saying to her children. She said, you begin to smell yourself now. You're getting too big for your britches. I'm from the South, so I'm just, you know, it's one of those things. You, you, you know, you may not have heard that. And, and 
when we thought that we could speak back or say something to our parents, my mom, my dad had a way of touching me that changed my viewpoint. They were able to touch me in a place that changed my perspective. When we get to a point where we feel like we're untouchable, God has a way of checking us. And God does it in such a way that either we're going to become, hu become humble or we're going to become humiliated. We're either going to humble, become humble, or we're going to become humiliated. And see, when I become, when I, when I, when I push back against the correction, God says, see, now you're going to be humiliated. See, because you could have, you could have accepted my, 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 my humility, but now you're going to become humiliated because you're pushing back against what I am trying to do. I'm trying to correct you, but you don't want my correction. God says, I'm trying to bring you back to me, but you keep on putting, we're rebellious. See, my, my, I'm going to tell you, my, my parents didn't stand for rebelliousness. They did not stand for it. And so just because you have a title, just because you think you're unreachable, just because you think you're untouchable, don't think that God can't touch you because he will touch you. I'm telling you, he will touch you. So he says, finally, my brother, and back over in Ephesians chapter six, verse number 10, he says, be strong in the Lord. Now then, he says, and in the power of his might. The Bible says, when I am weak, then am I made strong. See, I have, to, I have to become weak in myself in order that I might rely on him to be my total strength. See, you and I should not be going around bragging about what you have done. No, you should be telling somebody about what God has done through you, for you, and even in spite of you. See, you don't stop God's agenda. You, don't, you and I cannot stop God's agenda. God's agenda, beloved, is God's agenda. God is going to do what God has, is, is, he is going to do what he loves to do. And he loves to bring glory. Watch this, watch this, beloved. Watch this, watch this. You got you to see this. You got to see this. Here in verse 11 of Ephesians 6, he says to put on the what? The whole armor of who? God. You can put on your vestments. You can put on all of your, your, your accoutrements. You can put on all of your civic dress. You can put on all of these robes and drape yourself in all of this attire. If you do not have the, if you don't have, if you don't have the whole armor of God, the devil don't care what you got on right now. I promise you, the devil, he will disrespect you even in what you got on when you do not have on the whole armor of God. And then he says, there's a reason why that you, catch this in verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the lion. I said lion, I replaced devil because, because again, if you go back over to first Peter, amen, and see, and, and, and see what, and see what we're talking about, praise God. If you go back over to first Peter chapter five and look at verse seven and eight, you'll understand why I replaced what I just did, you'll understand why I just replaced the devil with the lion. These are characteristics. These are things. If you start examining this, if you start pulling this to the understanding of what you're dealing with, truly understanding your enemy, this is what this is about. He says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the wiles of the lion. Notice then. It says, contrary to what you might believe, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So let's go back over to First Peter. <laughs> let's go back over to First Peter. Praise God, Sister Yarber. <laughs> Woman of God, amen. Amen. I, I love what you I love what you just said. God is so loving. He'll pull your coattail behind closed doors first. Hallelujah. Your rebellion to correction is what causes your stuff to be exposed. To, that's the humility I was talking. I mean, the humiliation. That's the humiliation I was talking about. That's the humiliation I was talking about. Proverbs 13, 1. Thank you. Yes. Yes. See, see, when you know it's in there, praise God. When you know it's in there, Oh yeah, yeah. You 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 have you have a tendency then to to uh, allow God to deal with you from a different way. But back over, 
Praise God. Back over to First Peter, chapter number five. This this uh, this has been a as they say, this has been a blessing to me to to be here with you all in this capacity this week. And I tell you what, I'm 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 elated uh, of the Lord to be able to uh, spend some time with you like this in this this setting. So so now he says to be uh, sober, to be vigilant, to be sober, to be vigilant. The third thing I want you to take away today, and I have a few, I have a, a little while left. The third thing, the third takeaway, the devil imitates just as lions do. The devil imitates just as lions do. Lions, they roar to show how big they are. And they do it to scare you and they are fierce competitors. The lions, they roar in the distance to scare you. So I asked at the beginning, am I more afraid of the sound of the lion or am I more afraid of the sight of the lion? Now, what you and I should do, when the lion is roaring, I need to go in a different direction. I don't go in the direction of the lion I go in the opposite direction. I don't go in the direction of the sound. I go in the direction away from the sound. I am going in a different direction. I'm going away from the lion. I'm not going towards the lion. See, it takes, it takes a stupid person to go towards the sound as opposed to going away from the sound. Now, you probably said, wait, wait a minute, Bishop. Did not the Bible say that I'm to flee the very appearance of evil. That sound I just heard, that's an evil sound. And I don't need to be going towards it. I need to be going away from it. I'm, I'm trying to help somebody out. I'm trying to help somebody out this morning. Many of us, when we were in school, I'm going to help us out now. Many of us, when we were in school, when we saw a fight break out, we ran toward the fight. We ran right into the crowd because what? We were so wanting to see what was going on. Isn't it amazing that you see people today when they see some type of catastrophe, some something, you know, some type of, of, of fight or something. The first thing that we do today is we go towards, we take our cameras and our phones and we start doing these recordings. I have often asked myself, why do we take why do we start recording rather than trying to help? In other words, if you see something that is going wrong, dial 911 for God's sake. Do something to what? Help the person. But what you don't want to do is hinder the situation. Or, or should I hear, say help add to the problem? You're standing there watching this. You done ran to where you shouldn't be, but you're now you're there and you're not even doing anything to help. When you see your brother or sister, in need of daily necessity and you do nothing you say oh be warmed and feel that's not helping them that's not doing anything for them the bible says, he that knoweth to to do what good and do it not to him it is a sin people of god it is a sin it's a sin trying to help somebody out trying to help somebody out the lion the lion roars to scare you. I'm not scared of the sound. I just know that I need to go in the direction of the Lord. I'm not scared of the sound of the lion. I'm not sitting here at this table today telling you to be afraid of the sound of the lion. And nor am I telling you to be afraid of the lion. We're going to get that in a minute. I'm going to get done with it. All I'm telling you is don't endanger yourself unnecessarily. Don't put yourself in a situation that will cause you to be compromised. Don't do something foolish with your faith. And you probably say, I'm, I'm way off mark with that. But my, now in Luke's gospel, the fourth chapter, in Luke chapter four, you will see that Jesus was compelled to go into the wilderness and who arrived who showed up was the devil. The devil showed up 
and, 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 and he begins to tell Jesus some things. Now, number one, he knew Jesus was hungry. He knew Jesus was hungry. And he says, he says, I've heard it said that you can compel these stones to be made bread. Jesus said, yes, but you know what? Man cannot live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, it is the word of God that sustains me. It is the, it's the word of God that maintains me, beloved. It is the word of God that's going to do the same thing for you as it does for me. See, I'm not afraid of the lion's roar. And nor am I afraid of the lion's sight. The lion, when I have the word of God in me, the lion becomes afraid, not of me, but he's afraid of the God that's in me. For greater is he that is in me than is he that is in the world. See, the lion is in the world. The devil is in the world. The devil is the prince and power of this world. See, we're in the world, but we're not of it. We need to understand where our power is. The power of God is where we have power. The word of God. Jesus then is told this is the piece I want you to get. He took him on a high pinnacle and says, it's been said that you can cast yourself down and, and God will send you angels to bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. See, the devil is conniving. The devil wants us to commit spiritual suicide. The devil wants to jeopardize the ministry. The devil wants us to focus on self and not focus on who put us here to do what we were designed to do. Beloved, we were put here to do the work and will of God. We were not here to do our own agenda. We were not placed here to become, um, you know, our own, you know, whatever it is that we want. No, God's agenda is my agenda. God's will is my will. What God wants to be done is what I'm supposed to do for God. It's not the other, other way around. It, it, and I said it before. No, God, you're not on my time. I'm on your time. And whatever time you give me, God, I want to make sure that it's time used for your glory. Don't be afraid of the roar of the lion and don't be afraid of the sight of the lion. Jesus told the devil, do not tempt the Lord your God. Do, do not tempt me. Jesus, see, see the devil, the devil, the devil knows, and, 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 I, and I, have to, I have to show you this, because in James chapter one, the Bible says that God, can I, can I just take you there? Can I take you to James chapter five? I mean, chapter one, rather. Can I just take you there? Because I believe it's important. Because we're talking about, you and I are talking about how it is that this temptation can sometimes be fierce upon us. So the devil roars to instill fear, and he does so through persecution. He does it through fierce trials, and he does it through strong temptations. So in James chapter 1, in James chapter 1, he says in verse 13, let no man say, when he is tempted, when these fierce temptation comes upon you, when these trials comes upon you. Because if I read back up in verse number two, it says, my brethren, James chapter one, verse two, my brethren, we're to count it all joy when we face fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of my faith, I asked early, am I weak in my faith? knowing that the trine of my faith is going to work patience. But then I get down to verse 13. It says, let no man say that when he is tempted, that he is tempted of God. God doesn't tempt us. God does not tempt us. And then it says, for God cannot be tempted with evil and neither tempted he any man. But every man is drawn away by his own temptation when he is what? By his lust. And he's enticed. That's when my temptation comes. It, it, it starts with my own lust. It starts with my enticement. It starts with my inducement. And then he says, and when my lust conceives itself, it says, then it will bring about sin. And when sin is finished, it brings about death. 
See, there's a progression to my temptation. So here's what I'm here's what I'm saying. Just like the lion, just like the lion, the devil tries to instill instill fear in us with these strong temptations. We can resist that. The Bible tells us that we have the power to resist. You said, Bishop, what do you mean we have the power to resist? Here's the key. And I said it on, I said it on Monday. It says, first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I have to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Scripture also says that I am to seek God first. That I'm to submit to God first. Then I can resist the devil and he'll flee from me. Because when I submit to God, beloved, what I've really done is I am, I am yielding my will. I'm yielding my spirit to the will of God. And so therefore I am in submission to God. And so once I submit to God, God's spirit then takes over. God's spirit then Con it, it, it encapsulates me. It engulfs me when I yield my spirit to the spirit of God. God, have your way in my life. And then the Bible says, I can resist the devil and he'll flee from me. Now, the devil is not afraid of you. He's afraid of what you just, who you just submitted to. Let me say it again. The devil is not afraid of you. He's afraid of who you're submitted to. Praise God. Praise God. Give me a few more minutes and I'll be done. Give me a few more minutes and I'll be done. I'll leave you with this. It says, finally, the devil he devours. Notice it says in 1 Peter 5. It says in 1 Peter 5. It says, your adversary. Don't forget he's an adversary. He's, a, he's adverse to anything that you're averse to do. The devil is adverse to anything you're averse to do. See, he's against God if you are for God. He's against righteousness if you're for righteousness. He's against holiness if you're for holiness. The devil's agenda is always opposite of what you do for God. Let me share something else with you. Someone asked me the other day, Bishop, how do you know the difference between God's voice and the devil's voice. And I looked at that person. I said, let me tell you something. I said, here's the difference. When has the devil ever told you to do something good and it's always good for somebody else and for yourself? And it's always favorable to God. The devil will never tell you to do something good. So when you ask me a question, how do you know if it's God telling you to do this or it's the devil telling you to do this? If it's a good thing, you're going to be assured the devil didn't tell you to do it. Examine that good thing against God, though. Always examine that good thing against God. If, it, if that good thing seems, if it seems too good, then it might be too good. But if also, if it seems too bad to be had, you need to leave it alone. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. But if it's, if it's also too bad to be had, leave it alone. Don't mess with it. So what I'm saying to you is the devil, whatever the devil says, you have to check it against God's word to realize if it is not good, then you know who it came from. You know it's not, you know if it's, if it's good, the devil didn't tell you to do it. Can I say it again? If it's good, you better believe the devil didn't tell you to do it. So he goes around. <laughs> he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Lions don't eat with silverware. And neither does the devil. Lions don't eat with silverware. And neither does the devil. Like a lion, the devil wants to consume you until there's nothing left. And he will leave a mess when he departs. When the lion finishes, the, the devil, I mean, the lion, the devil, 
synonymous will leave a mess behind. They, the, the lion, the devil, will get its fill and leave you in pieces. The lion, the devil, will get its belly full and leave you in pieces. Here's the thing about God. God can take your pieces and make you whole again. Beloved, don't be afraid of the sound and don't be afraid of the sight of the lion. Keep yourself rooted in God. Now, let me move you to where we close it. Because the best idea is to be sober-minded and watchful. If I give you anything from this table today, if you've taken anything from it, the best idea as a Christian is to be sober-minded, not drunk on power, not drunk on who you see, not drunk on what they're doing. Be sober-minded and watchful. Be alert and stay alive. Be alert and always be prepared to take the fight to the devil. That's why Ephesians 6 was so important to give you. Always be prepared to deal with the devil, but don't make a deal with the devil. Always be prepared to deal with the devil, but don't ever make a deal with the devil. The, if you ever deal with the devil, if you make a deal with the devil, I promise you, you probably won't survive it. You probably won't make it through. So I leave you with this as we get ready to close. I'm, I, you know, I, I believe in teaching to the point of learning. In verse number nine of First Peter chapter five, it says, whom resist? See, we are told here now to resist. After we've been told to be sober, after we've been told to be vigilant, after we've been told why? Because your adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We are told now to resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, you're not the only one going through. You're not going to be the only one facing this. You're not the only, the only one that's going to hear the sound of the lion. And nor are you going to be the only one who's going to see the sight of the lion. What you will do is know that you are vigilant and you know how to deal with the devil. You're not making a deal with the devil. It says, but God, verse 10, but the God of all grace who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you have suffered a while, make you what? Perfect. He will make you perfect. He will establish you. He will strengthen and he will settle you. That is what this word says. I don't care what you heard from anybody, beloved. I'm telling you, when you stay your, when you stay the course, when you keep yourself, it says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For in as much as you know, beloved, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I thank you all for, for spending time with me in the word today. I pray that you have been blessed. I pray that you have been blessed by the teachings that you received through me from God because I only want to do my level best to please my Lord. And I thank you all for your prayers of me. I pray that you know how much you mean to me. And as I bring this to an end of this broadcast, uh, please like, tag, and share this word with others. Let somebody know that something has been shared at the table at Morning Manor Ministry that have been a blessing to you, and then may it be a blessing to somebody else. Many of you already know that on Wednesdays, Bishop asked us to uh, support the ministry. Amen. Uh, you know, he, he gives us the cash app information, and I'm going to ask someone to do that. Those who have that information readily available, uh, we have to be a blessing uh, to the people 
that that uh, this ministry supports and and there's there are ministries that this that this uh that you and I support praise God and so may may God allow you to be that blessing may God allow you to share this uh with someone else and again I thank you all uh for allowing me to be your servant I am your servant and I'm here to serve you and I and I, a, amen thank you sister Rollins uh, Praise God. Uh, but we, we are certainly here to do the work and the will of God. And may it be that we that we do, again, what the Lord has taught us to do. Our bishop, our man of God, we thank, we thank the Lord for uh, Bishop Bedden and, and Lady Bedden. Praise God. And, and, and we thank God for each and every one of you. So let's, let's, uh, let's do our, our diligence to uh, bless the ministry. Uh, bless what this ministry stands for. Bless what our bishop has asked us to support. Amen. And 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 again, he 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 has he has spoken to us. He's told us that that uh, that these that this support goes to bless so many other people. And and that is what moves my heart. Is that I know that it goes to a good purpose. It goes to a good cause. And uh, one thing you that you'll learn about this ministry is that it's all about giving back. It's not about taking in. It's all about giving back. We don't ask you uh, for it just for any reason. We we ask you to do this for a reason. So beloved, uh, amen. Thank God for each and every one of you. Keep me in prayer, amen, as we prepare for Friday. Uh, prepare your hearts, get ready, share with someone, tell somebody, Hey, you know what? We we're we're being blessed. You know, we we miss our we miss our man of God, Bishop Bedden, but thank God that we are still being fed. And so I pray that's what you've been receiving from me as I've set in in the absence of our man of God. So we love you all so so much. And again, we thank God uh, for each and every one of you for all of your love of us. So. Let's do what God wants us to do uh, each and every day, not just on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but throughout the week, throughout each week, throughout each day, each month, and throughout the year. If we do that, I believe that we're going to be made the better for it. Amen. Again, love each and every one of you. Keep praying one for another. Uh, as, as Bishop Ben would tell you, uh, he loves you and you can't do nothing about it. And uh, always stay in the word of God. Amen. That's the key. Always stay in the word. Whatever you do, he will tell you this. Whatever you do, stay in his word. Amen. So uh, thank God for you. And thank God for you sitting with me this week. Again, uh, I love you. I praise God for each and every one of you. And may God bless your socks off this week and the rest of this day. Amen. Love you so much.